Good evening. I'm Gwen Philbrook with the New York Times. Welcome to the last event of our 11th annual Arts and Leisure Weekend. Some might say that we saved the best for last. We wanted to have some serious fun on the last night as well as some serious talk. And tonight's guests are the perfect finale. They are leaders in a new generation of comedic writers, actors, and producers. Their latest collaboration, the film 5050, is a critical and box office success with an unusual theme, the healing power of friendship when life's complications arise, in this case, cancer. The film, based on the true life story of these two collaborators and friends, is nominated for three Independent Spirit Awards, including Best Feature and Best First Screenplay. It won the National Board of Review's 2011 Best Original Screenplay Award, and it was just nominated for Best Original Screenplay by the Writers Guild of America. You will hear much more about the film and the very talented people who made it from our moderator. He's a reporter on the culture desk of the Times, and he is the lead contributor to the must-read Arts Beat column and blog. He is also the author of the unsparingly honest memoir, Cocaine's Son, and is currently working on a new book about the Oscar-winning landmark film, Network. Now please join me in welcoming Dave Itzkoff and our very special guests, Seth Rogen and Will Reiser. Seth, Will, thank you so much for uh, being here tonight, especially on a night when you could be at home watching Downton Abbey. We really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, was, it was hard, but we made it. We made it. it was God between that, yeah, it's right. tough. <laughs> so, Will, I wanted to start by asking, I mean, as you've been on the, you know, the, the award season uh, campaign trail for this movie, I understand, by the way, you just got nominated for a Writer's Guild Award for the screenplay. There. I did. I did. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. In, in the course of, of promoting this film, have you gotten pretty comfortable sharing your medical history with complete strangers? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. And they have gotten completely comfortable sharing theirs. Right. So it goes. It goes. <laughs> well do you? I mean, do you mind if I ask you? You know, you know what what your health is now, what your prognosis is? Oh, I'm. Uh, it's been six years. I'm um, completely you're, healthy. You're in. Re you're remission. I'm in remission. You're remiss. Yeah. 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 Right. Is. I mean, would that have been almost impossible to imagine six or seven years ago when you were first given the diagnosis? Um, you know, it's funny. I, it's something I never really thought about what my health was going to be like down, down the road. It's sort of, <clears throat> when I was sick like that, all I could think about was just the immediate present. I couldn't really foresee what I would, my life would be like health-wise in the future. Um, but, I mean, looking back, I mean, it is... I sometimes uh, have trouble actually, you know, recognizing that that I did actually go through something so traumatic, um, which you know, it's sometimes nice to forget things like that. Right. <laughs> then let's go back to you know just so, some hopefully happier times. Can you tell me just about the era when the the two of you first met? I mean, you were both comedy wonderkins. <laughs> were, you, were you both kind of writing comedy right out of the womb? Uh, in the womb, in no, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> with placenta juice, right? Uh, uh, we we first met uh, at an office on on Sunset Boulevard, um, at uh, and it was me and Evan had gotten hired as writers for the Alley. Evan G is his show. his writing partner. Yeah, Evan's my writing partner, uh, and uh, and Will was a producer for the show, and. Um, we were all pretty young. I remember feeling very threatened by Will because I thought like we were going to be the only young guys, and then there was another young guy, and I didn't like that. Uh, and then I realized he we, was twenty-one. Yeah. Then I realized I we had different jobs also, so it didn't threaten me too much. But um, Will had to lie to people all day, which that was, was my a job. very stressful job. Uh, and I got to write jokes all day, which wasn't that bad. And um, and and Will looked really. Uh, he, we, we thought it was the stress, but he was pretty sick throughout the time that we were... Over the course of the show, I just I, my health slowly deteriorated more and more to the point that they really... We were... thought it was from lying to James Lipton, but it wasn't. It was, <laughs> uh... You know, I mean, as people who have seen 50-50 know, I mean, there is a sequence in the, in the movie where Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character, of course, gets the diagnosis from the doctor, and the doctor is totally, you know, dispassionate and almost more interested in this statistics of it and the fact that a young guy has, this has happened to a young person and he's kind of zoning out. Is that, I mean, is that sort of consistent with 
your own experience of, of, of learning what had happened? Uh, dealing with doctors? Yeah. <laughs> That's um, good. Yeah. I, I mean, I would, I would say that, I mean, I, I, I dealt with, you know, dozens of doctors over that, the course of, you know, the time I was sick. And um, you, I definitely noticed that there were some doctors who just, they, they would treat, they would treat you more like they were a mechanic in your car, and they were just diagnosing you in a very mechanical way. And, uh, and it's very dehumanizing, but at the same time, I, I, in retrospect, I can look back, and while I was writing it, I really thought about how, um, that's, how that's a coping mechanism for doctors. You know, the, more, you know, the more personal they are and the more they get to, to know you and connect with you on a human level, that means the more that they are invested and the less that they're thinking they're not as clear-headed because their you know their decisions are much more based on their feelings towards you. So I can I can I can definitely understand that. But it, I definitely did have a doctor who um, just talked into a dictaphone. He did not tell me you know he would not talk to me directly. He would talk into a dictaphone and then ask me you know and then allow me to ask questions afterwards. And it was really confusing and it was really disorientating. And I. I mean, when, and I would be in the office alone by myself, and there was no one there to be like, wait a second, dude, did you just tell him he had cancer? Like, I was completely, it was baffling. Right. But like, literally I mean, the first guy to give you your diagnosis that he's like just talking into a thing, and here, listen to this tape in the next room. I'll <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly, right. exactly wow. yeah. And, you know, it, just as you guys are, are first meeting as, as colleagues, is it, is it hard to open up to people and to, to, to tell them that, you know, this is part of my life, this is what I'm going through? Uh, well, he didn't. Uh, he got he got sick after we were already friends. We didn't know he was sick when we were first kind of becoming friends. Ironically, how we became friends often is we would smoke cigarettes together. Um, <laughs> we were the only two writers who s smoked <laughs> on the show. <laughs> we both quit um, since. Uh, but uh, yeah, but but by the time he got sick, we were we had been friends for a little while at least. Um, the diagnosis had been like a year. Yeah, at least a year. Um, but we still, you know, yeah, the, but we still had a hard time, you know, really talking about how scary it was. And well, how, I don't think uh, we talked about that at all. Yeah, we never talked about it. We joked around about yeah. it. And we, we thought about what kind of movie we could write about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so even, even in that era, I mean, you're, you're feeling sufficiently comfortable, confident that, you know, oh, this is something I could just put in a, in a screenplay. That's how I'm going to deal with it. I think it was, just, it was just the way we dealt with it. I think that yeah. we were both really scared and I you know I was 25 you were 23 and it's not we did not know how to talk about our feelings so yeah. we would just come up with ridiculous movie ideas yeah that was our coping mechanism in the movie with the guys try to get laid we would sit at our apartment and smoke weed and think of what funny movies we could turn into a young guy having cancer uh, uh. <laughs> we we initially thought of doing a parody of the bucket list that we would call the it list. Yeah. <laughs> and, in, and it was, instead of them going to like India and racing Mustangs, they would like try heroin and like <laughs> go to Thailand and like kill someone or some shit, like, <laughs> like play Russian roulette or something. Like the real fucked up version of the bucket list was. Uh, and then get out of every situation by using the cancer card. Exactly. We thought he would literally have a cancer card. Yeah, I, I have cancer. Yeah, I give cancer. it to people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not a bad movie idea altogether, I, I want to say. Yeah, it's yeah. Not. <laughs> but just, in, Will, in, in your private moments, or even, even before you started you know, telling people that you were close with, just to, you know, to be that young, to have been given that, that kind of a diagnosis, you know, I mean, do you think, you know, I'm young, I'm immortal, I, I'm totally going to beat this, or do you think, wow, you know, I haven't even lived my life yet, and, it, and it's over? Well, I am Jewish, so <laughs> that, that I'm totally going to beat this, yeah, so I'm really I, running through yeah. uh, <laughs> those Jewish people's heads. Yeah. <laughs> Everything will be fine, yeah. <laughs> we would actually kind of joke when it happened about how Will was like the worst guy to get cancer, like character-wise. Like, I was a total hypochondriac. He was, a, was, he was neurotic, he was hypochondriac. He thought he was going to die before he had cancer, so. <laughs> cancer did not yeah. make things better. <laughs> Because I mean, the thing is, they would joke. My, you know, Seth and, and Evan and some of our other friends would would make fun of me because I was always worried about my health. And then I really did get sick, and it was like this manifest destiny thing where I had basically just. And and so I mean, I had now I had living proof that you know I had proof that I was I was a sick person. So <laughs> it did not. Uh, yeah, my. I, it was validating. In it a was way. validating. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't know what it's like with your parents or grandparents where they like in my family they will not even say like 
cancer. They won't say it out loud. And so, because if you say it out loud, then you're inviting it into your life. I don't know if you, if you maybe felt like, oh, they were right about that. That's, that's maybe I shouldn't have said it out loud. You shouldn't have said cancer. Yeah. You didn't say it No, I know, no. Well, when, when after I was diagnosed, yeah. I think. You thought you had jaundice or something. Like <laughs> diabetes. 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 I was convinced I had diabetes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's something that I, you know, I never even really considered and that the movie made me think a lot about, which is just the, you know, the challenge of, of having to open up to your own family and, and, and tell them that this has happened to you. I mean, is it, is it challenging? I mean, in your, was it challenging in, your own, in their own life to, to, you know, have to tell your family members about it? Do you, do you, did you feel the need to sort of organize a sort of formal occasion to do it in that same way? <laughs> uh, no, no. That would have, I was living in L.A. They were, my, parent, my family was in New York, so it would have been odd if I had said, come to L.A., Right. Sit down for dinner. I'm gonna. T it would have been strange. So, <laughs> I called. I called. Uh, I called my mom. My mom was the first person I called, um, and she then immediately got on an airplane and came to L.A. <laughs> and went with me to one doctor's appointment. And then I immediately sent her back. To the <laughs> it was too intense having her just hovering over me. Um, I mean, th that story very much is yes, hovering. She's very big. She's huge. My mother, my mother is, is like five feet tall. It's very strange that Angelica Houston right. plays Adam's mother. But um, uh, it was actually, it was really interesting when they met for the first time on set, Angelica Houston and my mom. And I mean, Angelica Houston is just, just towers over my mother. She just looked down and she just said, you are nothing like what I thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is going to sound like a possibly sappy question, but I mean, can, how how important does friendship become in your life when you, when you get a, a diagnosis like this? I think I think I, I mean I, you know honestly I think I you know us hanging out every day was really was really important. It got me out of my head and got me out of thinking about all the worst case scenarios. You know the the, the potential. You know that you know was, you know, and it just got me. It, it stopped me from from thinking about the wor you know worst case scenario. So it, um, and just just laughing and just having fun um, was. I think that was really crucial. I think that that you know was uh, really important during the time I was sick. Right. Were you fearful that you know either you know existing friend friendships might dwindle or were I mean were there people who were not, you know, not as, as kind of you know kind as Seth was, who maybe just drifted away. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that the character of Rachel, who, you know, yeah. that she represents the, you know, several, several, you know, she's sort of an amalgam of several people in my life who just could not, people who, uh, you know, very close to me, people, you know, uh, friends and family who just couldn't deal with the situation and just bailed. And yeah. This um, is the Bryce Dallas Howard character? Yes, wow. yes. Bryce she's Dallas. just really getting it in all of her movies this season, isn't she? Nothing, <laughs> nothing good is happening to her this year. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's, she's all right with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's doing all right. She's doing pretty okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about for you, Seth? I, I mean, you know, did you, did you notice, uh, you know, I mean, in your own interactions with Will, I mean, did, did, you know, had, did things change at all once you know you were aware that he was sick, or you know did you did you maybe t treat him more gingerly? <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> um, he didn't. I will say that. I uh, no, I mean I I felt like uh, I didn't know what to do really, so I thought I would just try to act completely normally around him. Honestly. Um, I felt like if I was extra nice to him, it would have been a suspect awfully fast and uh, <laughs> probably alienated him even more from what his normal experience was, you know? Um, and I kind of just took my cues from him. I mean, he seemed to want to do the same shit we did before he got sick, so I was like, yeah, might as well just do the same shit bef we did before he got sick. <laughs> and uh, he kind of seemed to joke around about it and talk about it, so I was like, yeah, I guess it's cool to joke around about it and talk about it. Um, we never talked about it seriously, but again, like we they talk about movie ideas, we bring it up as a joke. Like, right. uh, I remember after his surgery, we used his uh, cancer to skip the line opening weekend of Batman Begins. That was nice. something that was there's uh, a very long line. Of very long studios. line, as you could imagine, it was <laughs> Batman Begins. And um, <laughs> well, wait, tell me this story now. I mean, you uh, you literally you go up to an usher and you say, uh, well, we were so we're standing at we're at Universal Studios, Universal City Walk. It's open. It's yeah, Universal City Walk. This is before pre-reserved seating in movie yes, theaters. Yes, there was no reserved yeah. seating in movie theaters, and 
Um, it was it was opening weekend. It was um, a huge line, and Will. We uh, were gonna have to stand on it for over an hour, and I had just had my surgery, and I had this ridiculous back brace, and I couldn't really walk very well, and I I looked kind of pathetic, and <laughs> Seth just went up to the uh, the cashier at the ticket booth and just said, my friend, my buddy can't stand on this line. He had he had cancer. He just had surgery, and then I I like lifted up, <laughs> and, I showed, and I showed them this brace, and they. They were like, okay, all right, whatever, just have some come popcorn, inside, have come some inside. spray and shit, yeah. We didn't, we didn't have to pay, we right. didn't have to pay. Yeah. Like, like, I remember you were just like sitting in an empty movie theater like, <laughs> like before. Oh, yeah. right. <laughs> we, we changed seats several times. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Perfect, perfect seat. Of all, of all the cards you could have played, you could have been like, hey, I'm the knocked up guy, just let me in. I wasn't the knocked up uh, guy. No, at that yeah. point he was not. I this was just some unemployed stoner, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, this was probably like yeah. a, uh, a few weeks. Writer. This was like yeah. a few weeks before Four Year Old Virgin came out. Yeah, the it world, was. The, nobody knew. Yeah, that's what. It was the same summer. Yeah, it was yeah. before that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, as we're talking about, you know, the rare sort of silver linings that that, that this afforded you. There, there's a, a a wonderful scene in in the film where uh, the two characters sort of use uh, the cancer of Adam to help them meet women and mm -hmm. see if they can use it to pick them up. So uh, was that ever anything that you really attempted? When, when I was sick at that age, we were too terrified of women to have actually attempted that. Um, yeah. But I did, we never, we never actually, we discussed it. Yeah, we, we talked we, about we, we how talked it probably would have worked. Right. But we never actually, <laughs> we never actually did it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I did, however, introduce Seth to his wife while I was sick. Yeah. Yeah, and so, that worked out all right. Yeah, so, and it probably made me seem like extra. I don't think it would have. I think. And I think nice. Yeah, I think it's true. I think if you have a friend who is sick with an illness like cancer, it, it, it speaks only highly makes of you. you. Yeah, yeah, it only makes you look like a better person if you're but, spending time with them. But ha you're not turning that to your own advantage, Will. That's what this is. I use it to my advantage. <laughs> it did. It worked out. They got married. Exactly. It worked oh, yeah. out really well. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I, I ask you this strictly as a journalist and, and, and merely on behalf of, of others here who might uh, want to have their curiosity satisfied now. When you're diagnosed with cancer, how good is the weed that you're prescribed? Uh, well, Seth here was my pusher. Yeah. <laughs> he, that, I mean, that's it is true, true that he didn't get a I, I didn't. I didn't actually smoke weed until I got sick, and Seth actually got a prescription for medicinal marijuana, and he was my pusher. Yeah. Does it, I mean, did it have actual uh, uh, prophylactic effects, as they say, or I guess uh, did it have real bottle? I mean, aside from just, you know, making it. It helped, right? It definitely helped. I, there's no way I could have slept through the night with the pain I had in my back without it. I mean, that was. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> he, had, he had sympathy pain. All right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and The Matrix, that became more comprehensible. Yeah, exactly, yeah. There's no way I could have watched The Matrix that many times without <laughs> I mean, clearly you don't mind, you know, just at least in the course of this conversation, you know, joking about what you experienced and, and you know, you seem to have a really good sense of humor and spirit about it. And you, you know, I mean, you, at what point did you sort of decide this is something that I want to really, you know, I, I want to preserve in, in some kind of, you know, film form. I want to make a movie about this. Uh, well, it started. We were we were at a party one night, and I think that well, it was actually it was the same night that Seth and his wife Lauren met. Yeah, and we came up with the idea for Fifty Fifty. But it was while he was still sick. That it was we while I was sick. Yeah, it. Uh, yeah, and it was it was kind of it was sort of inspired by the fact that we there were just all these all these absurd things that would happen to me. Just things doctors would say to me. Uh, encounters I would have with pe you know friends and family members and just how no one, there was just so much dysfunction that and we were we were at a party and people were just be treating me like you know they they just weren't acting normal they were just acting and it was really funny to us that no one could actually just talk to me normally um, and they'd just be like how are you yeah, there's a lot of touching and rubbing and like and I've, of, they just do this a lot a lot of, oh, a lot of tilted poor. heads yeah, yeah. <laughs> and. <laughs> And we just went off and we were standing in the corner and we were like, we, you know, there's no movie that is about, you know, guys our age that, you know, represents what it's like to go through something like this. You know, movies that are about cancer typically are about middle-aged individuals who are, you know, really disconnected from 
from their family, and then over the course of the movie, they reconnect, and then the person dies. And that like wasn't what my experience was like. And we had a sense of humor, and we 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 just realized that there was no real comedy about you know what it's like to be young and have cancer. So that was. That's sort of where the discussion led to. Yeah, we were like, what if they did a movie where someone has cancer and has a sense of humor? <laughs> Genius. <laughs> that was kind of it. <laughs> and, that's it. and we came up with the, the characters of Adam and Kyle that night. And that was sort of, the, the, you know, that, that was sort of the genesis of yeah. the night. Right. And, and I, mean, I guess this also is, indicates that you felt good enough about your own situation or your health that you would be around to see this thing to fulfillment. Yeah. Perhaps. I mean, we yeah. hope so. I, yeah, I mean, I, th I think, you know, I didn't, I didn't start. I would think about, I would think about the, the idea for the movie. You know, I would think in my head for, you know, the year after I got better, um, I would think about it. And Seth and his writing partner Evan, um, who produced the movie with Seth, they really, you know, they would push me to, um, they really urged me to, to just start writing it. And um, I mean, it took me a while, but um, about a year and a half after I got better, it was when I actually started writing it. Um, I think. It was I was it was so close to home right afterwards that I I don't I wasn't quite ready but um, yeah I mean I you know it uh, it definitely it definitely took a while too. Right. Were there were there people in your life who either tried to talk you out of it or just couldn't understand why you'd want to take something that was that painful and you know turn it into fodder for either comedy or just you know a story that you wanted to put out there and share with the world? No, I can't think of. The only people who tried to stop me were like, the no studio is going to make a comedy. Yeah, like, your agents. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like, this is a terrible <laughs> idea. But um, other than that, you know, I, I, I felt mostly support from, from friends. Right. Um, were, I mean, was there, so the, but in terms of just the people that you work with in, in the industry, were, were there actually people who were saying, this is not a sellable thing, or we don't, you know, we don't understand, we don't see this as a viable project? Um, there was people, I mean, uh, the approach was to just, uh, you know, do it smartly. I think people were, not that we would attempt it, but I think, you know, uh, it was at a moment in our career that has since kind of gone past a little bit when we were like really awesome <laughs> and uh, oh. could kind of get anything made very easily, though. That's he, what I mean. I mean, I mean in terms I, I, of just our momentum. Uh, and now it's really hard for us to get shit made. But then it was would have been really easy. It's because we made uh, a cancer comedy. Exactly. Like, it so, ruined everything. Uh, <laughs> so um, the, I think people's fear was our instinct would be to make the biggest version of it we possibly could have instead of making a much more responsibly sized version of it, which, right. which was our instinct. I mean, at that time, we had seen firsthand how more money essentially equals more interference from the studio, or at least input from the studio. And uh, we didn't really want that. So right. we thought at this budget, we could kind of do whatever the hell we want. Right. Was there a concern also, I suppose, that maybe you might do something that w wouldn't treat it with the proper dignity or that, you know, this could be the, you know, the, this would be the animal house of, of cancer <laughs> comics, whatever that, whatever that might be. That sounds good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we should have done that. We should have. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, that was, uh, no one really actually expressed that uh, concern, probably very stupidly, but no one really was, uh, yeah, that, that didn't really come up. And I think because right. Will had experienced it, you'd, you'd, you'd really look like an asshole telling him not to try to write this movie because uh, he had cancer, for God's sakes. <laughs> it's like telling yeah, the hurricane if, not to, you know, or Antoine. <laughs> Fisher. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it, Antoine. Right. But I mean, even if, I mean, if even if we had never made the made the movie, writing the script was the most cathartic thing I could have possibly done yeah. because it was it was my way to say and express all the things that I didn't know how to and didn't have sort of the emotional tools to do when I was actually sick. So, and we, I mean, over the course of writing it, we would have conversations about the experience, and that, I mean, was. Yeah. It was great for the script, but it was also really beneficial to our friendship. Yeah, yeah. Just tell me a little bit about, you know, I mean, how long it took to, to write the screenplay and, and, and what, you know, I mean, did, did you, you know, did you, did you, were there things that you kind of imbued it with that either things you wished had happened to you, things you would have liked to have done while this was actually going on in your life, or was it fairly biographical? Well, the I mean, the movie itself is, is fiction. I mean, it's, it's really, um, I just, I took the themes and, um, you know some of some of the the, the moments that that happened to me. I mean, the, you know, the the, the storyline between, you know, Adam and and his mother. I mean, that that very much is, that's very close to you know what occurred with me and my mother. But you know, everything else. I mean, I didn't have a therapist. 
I did have a therapist, but she wasn't she wasn't 24 years old. Right. You know, she was in her mid 60s, and um, but he fucked her. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't. That's that's what you do in therapy, isn't it? <laughs> We're not going to top that. No, Let's just call yeah, it a yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So that's true. <laughs> um, but the movie, the movie as a whole is, you know, is fiction just inspired by my experience. So, um, I mean, I definitely, we, something I, you know, we've sort of found is over the course of developing the movie was that there were moments that really happened, and I, and I, and I wrote them and, and integrated them into the script almost verbatim as they occurred in real life. And I remember, you know, Seth would read a scene and be like, I don't understand what the point, like, what, this is so weird. Like, no nurse would ever say that to, you know, a patient. I'd be like, well, that, that actually happened to me. You know, but it was like, it was so absurd that it just seemed unbelievable. So there were things that I, you know, I would just have to take out because they just seemed so, you know, foreign so, to the truth. Right. It was so far flung. Yeah. Right. Other yeah. than that, Seth, I mean, what, what, kind of, what kind of notes would you, would you tend to give him? Or what, what were you trying to sort of, you know, bring out of what he was writing? Um, I mean, we really wanted it to feel as on like a really honest movie. So we really tried to, you know, draw as much of his own experience out of uh, him as possible. But at the same time, we wanted to make a really good movie. So there was some stuff that happened, and we were like, it doesn't matter. It's stupid in the movie. <laughs> so, uh, d you know, we shouldn't do that. So, um, but I think like the biggest, honestly, uh, the first draft, a few things developed. Probably the character of Adam is the thing that me and Evan developed the most with Will. Probably, I think, because Will probably had the least ability to analyze himself as opposed to everyone else who he was actually interacting with at that point in his life. Um, so I remember in the first draft, the character really didn't change that much because at that time, Will couldn't even recognize that he had changed a lot. Um, and we had to tell him, like, you are a way happier, easier person to be around than you were before you got sick. You should put that into the script because it, it, it is that case. I, had no, I did not have the perspective. The, the first draft was called How I Learned Nothing from Cancer. Yeah. That was literally what I what I. And we were like, but it. you did learn something from cancer, or we probably still wouldn't be friends with you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then the character was overly sympathetic, I think. Just the character really do much wrong. And I think it took a lot of conversation to kind of draw out the fact that he should have communicated more with his mother and that he should have articulated his expectations of people more rather than just assuming everyone would behave in a certain way. Um, and, and that kind of stuff really came from a lot of in, intense conversations that happened you know, leading up to the, the filming of the movie and really working those scenes. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. And, and, you know, I mean, it, part of, I think, what, you know, gives the, the film its, its, you know, its warmth and its, its humanity. I mean, you, there's this, you know, the performance by Joseph Gordon-Levitt is just wonderful. And I, mean, I wonder if you could tell, talk just a little bit about, you know, finding him and, and you know, how, how he, uh, you know, became that character. Um, it's a funny story. Um, <laughs> well, James McAvoy was going to be in this movie and then... Uh, had to leave, and we had to replace him. He had to leave as we were shoot, like yeah. we the first week of production. Yeah, and so we had around four days or so to find a replacement, or we just weren't gonna make the movie anymore. Wow. So and we were in Vancouver. We were in Vancouver. We were, we were, we were shooting. We were scared. Um, I called. Uh, it was very I called Joe, and I'd met him a few times, and I was totally honest with him. I was like, "We're f we need an actor. You're an actor." <laughs> <laughs> What do you say? And um, he read. He was. He he read the script, and he flew to Vancouver the next day, and uh, got real drunk with us. And um, and then said he would do it. And then he said he would do it. And then we started filming like four days after that. The alcohol was the key. It was. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so so the truth is, Joe only read the script for this movie around six days before his first day of filming in this movie, which is insane. which is crazy. Uh, so yeah, like, and that was the head shaving scene. So like, he 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 shaved his head within like a week of reading the script. Uh, which is crazy. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't do that. Just like, <laughs> I remember telling him, like, I wouldn't be doing this, man. Like, this is nuts. Like, you're shaving your head. Like, this right. isn't just taking a roll. Like, if you decide you don't like us tomorrow, you're
fucking bald now. <laughs> and, but we were, I mean, we got really lucky because we, as soon as, as soon as James, we knew James couldn't do it anymore, we, Joe was really the only actor that we wanted. Yeah. And we couldn't think of anybody else. And we, we, you know, we were really lucky because I, you know, on it's such like for notice. It's like the luckiest thing that's ever to happened find an that actor, we were able to find him. Yeah. Like, someone who can do drama and comedy as proficiently as, yeah. as someone like Joseph Gordon-Levitt is, I mean, that's, you know, at that age, it's. I've spent like years trying to get someone in a movie. The fact that he did it in like four days is ludicrous. Right. And, it's and then like, he was available. It, yeah, it's yeah. totally so if, I mean, if he's not free when you make that call, maybe there, this movie would not. It's possible, yeah. That's unbelievable. I would be playing both roles. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we had discussed that. <laughs> David had... Fincher would have come in. <laughs> was it a given, though, that, I mean, Seth, you were clearly going to, to play the kind of, you know, the, the friend role? That, yeah. That was the character's name was Seth from and up until... Pre-production. Like, yeah, let's just change the title. We should change it. <laughs> but I, I, I mean, I wrote it for Seth, and the character's name was Seth for a very long time. Yeah, it was always going to be me, um, because it was me. So yeah, that was the only part that we wrote <laughs> for, for me. <laughs> I mean, do you feel like in, in in playing a role like this is is that you know is it is it? I mean, clearly it's different than other comedic roles that you you've played, right? Uh, or not? A little bit. I mean. Um, I generally just try to be as naturalistic as I can be, you know? I mean, that means different things in different movies. I mean, being natural, you know, in the scene where your friend is telling you has cancer is, will come across differently than being natural in the scene where, you know, you're getting chased by drug dealers or something like that. But, like, honestly, I'm just trying to do the same thing, which is, like, what would I be doing in this exact situation? And then I try to think, and let's try to make that a little bit funny also. Um, <laughs> and, and I really wasn't doing anything different, honestly, in this movie than anything else. I think, I think because of Joe's performance and what it's about, it, 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 and, and just of how kind of small it felt and how kind of uh, real a lot of the scenes felt, I think it comes across as a little different maybe than some other stuff I've done, but I wish, I wish I could take a lot of credit for that, but it felt like I was doing the same shit I always do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll say that I think, you know, part of it has to do with the chemistry between Joe and Seth. I think that they, I mean, it was instantaneous, and, um, and Joe really did, like Seth said, I mean, he really did ground it, you know, and yeah. so um, I think that they, they really worked, it worked really well, the two of them playing off of each other, and they are so different, and I think that that, I mean, I, I, mean, I think that that really did, you know, help, you know, in a very, you know, sort of unconscious way, you know, yeah. so. I, Seth, I imagine you, you get asked these about all, all of your films, but I mean, you, you, you are known for, you know, an improvisational ability, and you've certainly done that in, in, early, in previous comedies. Is this the kind of film where, you, you know, you were given some latitude to do that, and can you do that when, you know, your best friend who wrote the script is standing right there and maybe wants you to stick to the script? Uh, you can when you're the producer. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, we didn't have a ton of time to make this movie on the grand scale of movies we've made. So I how think many how many shooting days was it? What was it? We had 25, 25? and then we yeah. had four more additional pickup days. That we shot later. They we were reshoots. Just call them reshoots. Uh, <laughs> people hate we that word. <laughs> we reshot some shit. <laughs> we didn't shoot it right the first time. Um, Let's try but, that pot smoking scene one yeah, more time. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, I mean, so yeah, that's like honestly like half the length of one of our other yeah. movies. So, uh, but that being said, I mean, yeah, we tried to. There's certain we kind of picked our moments. I think there's certain scenes we improvised heavily in, and there's certain scenes that are exactly how they were written. Um, and I think you, what I think is neat is you probably can't guess which ones are which. Um, the ones that sometimes seem written are improvised and, and vice versa. Yeah, I mean, like, my, my favorite, one of my favorite scenes is the scene in which um, the guys, so uh, Joe and Seth, and then um, are, they're sitting with, with Alan and Mitch, and they're, they're smoking weed out in the backyard, and they have a conversation about radio. And that was all improvised. And it's, um, it was an idea that Joe came up with. And it was really just supposed to be, it was really just kind of a montage scene. And yeah. it was supposed to just, you know, just be general banter. But, um, but we ended up using it because it was really amazing stuff that, the, that those guys came up with. And it was really, it was just it's four great actors just having a conversation in character. And, um, but you would never, when you watch that, you don't think. 
you would never think like, oh, that that was entirely improvised, but it was, and right. I think it's really impressive. Is this your first produced screenplay? Yes. Right. And could you allow yourself? I mean, you you, you would sort of. Uh, Give them the freedom to to sort of run with you know what wasn't necessarily on the page, or you sort of yeah. Guys, I think everything my screenwriting career is writing on this. You really got to stick to the page. No, I think I think you know you can't be precious. I think it's yeah. just what's what's best for the film, and I think you you know I think you find things that you you know you wouldn't know were there if you didn't if you didn't let actors just try try other things. Right. And then you get credit for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Seth, you, you just a couple of years ago, you, you made a film with Adam Sandler uh, called Funny People, in which uh, your character becomes uh, an assistant to his character at a time when he's dealing with a, a potentially fatal illness. You know, I mean, is is the tone of a film like that? I mean, it's clearly different from Fifty Fifty. Yeah, you say. a little bit. Yeah, uh, I think it's kind of a more it's a more epic, sprawling telling of a story like that. Um, and and the character is so different, and the world it takes place in is so different. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's funny actually. We had been working on Fifty Fifty when <laughs> Judd K uh, brought up um, that he wanted to do Funny People, and I remember there there was a conversation of like, is it weird that I'm playing? the friend of two guys with cancer, but uh, <laughs> we kind of, uh, I don't know, we just decided, oh, what the hell. I mean... Uh, as long as they weren't released yeah, the same exactly. year. I've decided a long time ago, people are going to say I do the same shit no matter what I do, so I might as well just do the same shit. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we right. just, they seem different enough to yeah. us that uh, it, it, it it wasn't, you know, right. they, you know, it wouldn't have been bad to do both. No, movies. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, they're different films are different tonally. But I mean, I remember, I mean, even when, when, not, uh, when Funny People came out, there, I mean, there, you know, there was some, you know, some talk or some people thought, you know, well, you know, is a person's, you know, near fatal situation, an, you know, an appropriate subject for, you know, a film, that, you know, that's intended for a wide audience? Do, do people, you know, even want to see that in in a, in a comedy? I mean, is that is that an experience that you you went through even with funny people, and that did that give you any pause in terms of you know the fifty fifty experience? Uh, I honestly think the things that make most people have pause are the things that make things seem exciting to us. I mean. Uh, the kind of bigger margin for error there is, to me, the more exciting of a creative endeavor it is, you know? Um, the more it could go wrong, the more exciting it is when you make it go right, you know? So I think, you know, the idea of, you know, trying to tackle something like that uh, comedically is it's a really exciting challenge. And I think it's something that it's universal, everyone dies. Uh, Except some people, you know, the Highlander, obviously, the, course, being the one exception. <laughs> um, so our films are not for him. But uh, <laughs> I think, uh, I think generally, you know, it's it, it, it is a very appealing thing to try to tackle creatively. It's something that you think about a lot, um, and, and to make it appealing to an audience. And yeah, and, and to make it digestible and and fun to watch as opposed to miserable to watch is something that's very exciting to attempt to do, I think. Right, right. Do you, but you don't necessarily experience pushback from, you know, the people with the power to make these films who say, you, you know, that you're, you're, you're going to bum people out, you know, that nobody wants to see a film about X or Y. Or oh, yeah, no, we hear that a lot. Uh, <laughs> you just got to kind of power through it or lie to them and manipulate them into thinking you're not actually doing what you're doing. That works sometimes. Uh, <laughs> Nod and say yes. Yeah, oh, yeah, no, yeah, we won't great. make it seem too cancery. And then, uh, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but that's why, I mean, you know, 50-50 we made for $8 million. Exactly. With an independent financier. If, yeah. we had, if we had made it with a studio like Universal, I mean, we wouldn't have had, you know, we would not have had the control. and we It would have, have been harder. Not to say they would have specifically ruined it, but uh, it, it would have been harder probably. Um, and, and then once, you know, and, but those conversations came up in the marketing of the movie because by then it was owned by a studio. And, and there was a lot of questions of like, how much do you make it seem like it's about a guy with cancer? <laughs> and, and we had no title for the movie. Yeah. So that was something also is like how, you know, for lack of a better word, cancery, do you make the title of the movie and the whole marketing in general? So yeah, that that definitely right. uh, so even came up. even something like calling it fifty fifty. At least that's a potentially a way to signal to the audience like this. This could turn out okay. There's that that part of it that means things 
True, yeah. yeah. Our yeah. goal was to come up with a title that wasn't uh, horribly repellent to an audience. That, <laughs> that should be a good guiding principle. Generally a yeah. good goal, yeah. It was either going to be 50-50 or tumor hazard. Yeah, tumor <laughs> hazard. <laughs> uh, which one are, <laughs> Hairless in Seattle is my favorite. <laughs> But that's potentially repellent to an audience. Yeah. Unfortunately. Hairless. Hairless. Just, just been hairless. Hair. Just hairless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> were there were there other titles that you can remember that maybe came close and just almost ended? Cancer Face. Cancer Maybe's Face. Yeah. <laughs> no. uh, uh, the Adventures uh, of Cancer Face. No. Uh, we had it was impossible. it was called I'm with Cancer for a long time. Yeah. That was the title that it had when Will originally wrote it. Well, no. First it was called How I Learned Nothing from Cancer. And then the second draft and there up until pre-production was called I'm with Cancer, which we all kind of grew to like, but. I don't know, again, potentially repellent, so... Uh, and then it was just called Untitled Cancer Comedy. Uh, which, which also was, was really not, repellent. There yeah. was like a week where we were like, can we call it that? Is that... <laughs> you know, kind of says it all, yeah. <laughs> but... It's pretty hip, though. Yeah, it's a little hip. Uh, and people would walk by set and they'd be like, Untitled Cancer... Yeah, say exactly, yeah, it's true. It was said it on our pie on our orange cones, Untitled Cancer Comedy, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Right. You don't have to worry about people trying to like break in on that. Yeah, exactly. No. <laughs> Seems like a bummer. Right. <laughs> uh, but there were other titles like we get well soon. Oh yeah, get well soon. And there was, um, it was it's hard to come up with a name for a cancer comedy. That's what we learned from this experience. <laughs> um, but uh, 50 but yeah, those things came up definitely. And is, it was Bryce Dallas Howard who came up with Fifty Fifty. Really? Yeah. For the title. Yeah. Right. Oh. Well, we after what she her. went through in the help, I feel she deserves like. it. Yeah. She deserves it. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I mean, were she you... like eat someone in that movie? I haven't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk after. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> You're the last person an left. Animal? She eats an animal. Yeah. Is that what it is? She eats What's an animal. Movie? I'm thinking of fried green tomatoes. <laughs> yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> she eats an animal byproduct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fried green tomatoes. They eat a guy though, right? No, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Okay. I'm not gonna see that. <laughs> Anywho. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, were those? I mean, were you were you literally given those kinds of odds when when you were diagnosed? No, oh. no. Uh, they don't really give you odds. No, there was yeah. No, uh, WebMD gave you those odds though, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, what happened? I, I never actually looked up what my. I never knew what my odds were. And then when we were when we were in the script, I wrote some. You know, I wrote that there was a percentage when he when he you know when Adam looks, you know, looks it up. You know, his diagnosis online, and. We used WebMD's website, and they created a page for us that was, you know, a, like a fake website that he could go and look at. And they were the ones who basically told us those were the odds. And so right. we must also credit WebMD with the 50-50 <laughs> portion. Yeah. Right. Did you? I mean, did any of your experience from knocked up, which obviously is about a very different and more sort of joyous uh, medical <laughs> condition, but you know, I mean, that 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 generated it's medically themed. Yeah, yeah sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shot in a lot of hospitals. Yes, exactly. Yeah, played a doctor. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But that, I mean, that also engendered some some discussion of, of the schmushmorshan issue yeah. and whether or not that was even appropriate for for filming. I mean, did anything? Yeah. You know, from what you took from that movie, go into this in terms of you know how do we present things that are potentially uh, you know touchy or, or could make people uncomfortable. Uh, I mean, if I've learned, if one thing keeps happening, it's it's that people are willing to accept a lot more than I think a lot of people would assume. I mean, every time we make a movie, there's like one or two parts where we're like this is crazy, people are gonna reject this. And that's like generally the part people like the most, you the, know. The Patrick Swayze. Joke. Yeah, like, we, were like we don't a, know if that's gonna fall. We yeah, we're like people will just. Well, there's no way we can leave that in. And then we show it to people, and they really seem to respond well to it. Because and, and I think it's because they get our intention is to not be mean or not you know be slanderous in any way, but to just try to be honest and to show these are the kind of conversations yeah. people actually have in those situations, you know. Um, and that's what we found in Knocked Up is that. You know, if if I knocked up a girl, my friends would tell me to get an abortion. Like that would happen uh, at that time in my life. Now I'm married, and that wouldn't happen. But uh, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> but um, that, but 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 so that's we we had to shoot it. It would have seemed disingenuous to to make a scene about a young dude who gets a girl pregnant and not have a scene where his friends tell him to get an abortion. Right. And just like that, it, it was like that with this. It almost seemed it seemed weird to have a scene where I'm trying to bring up. You know celebrities uh, and cancer, and to not acknowledge Patrick Swayze at that moment. <laughs> um, so it's all. I mean, honestly, we try not to shy away from what we think these conversations would actually be, uh, and as long as it feels honest, then I think people go with it. 
And if it feels, it can like, relate to. Yeah, it. I mean, relate I think these are conversations. These are not conversations that are foreign to people. I mean, I think yeah. people have these conversations yeah. as well. So. Yeah. Uh, you referenced terms of endearment. I mean, that certainly came out in an era when it seemed like maybe you know movie making was a little bit more. Uh, you know, it, it, I mean, there were filmmakers who really just wanted to kind of you know touch on every possible subject, and maybe that spirit went away for a little while. I mean, does it feel like? Do you feel like you're operating in, in a similar era where there is an appetite for movies that really are about every you know potential aspect of the human condition again? Um, is that a big map? I don't know if we, I don't know, but I'll I like writing movies about that. So you know, that, well, I hope so. So, so yeah. I hope so. Yeah, uh, It'd be good for us. I mean, it ebbs and flows. I think like anything, uh, but yeah, it seems like I mean, yeah, it's I mean, people accepted this movie generally speaking, which was, I mean, yeah, there was a real chance that just like you'd be in a video store in three years and be like, they made a <laughs> cancer comedy called Fifty Fifty. What's that? Uh, but but that didn't happen. It seemed to be a movie people liked and, and accepted. So. Um, it, it's it, so I guess the answer is yes. People seem to be a little bit more accepting of that thing right now. But who's to say, you know, ten years ago it wouldn't have worked? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Hard, hard to say. Right, right. Well, you know, we I mean, we've, we've talked about you know life or death situations for for a while tonight. So at the, you know, just to belabor the obvious, I mean, there is something very funny about people who are in really trying situations and life or death moments. Yeah. Uh, Someone smarter than me once said something like pain is comedy or some shit like that. Pain is funny, something, I don't know. But uh, yeah, that's true, I think. Uh, the best comedy comes from tragedy. That's it, there you go, that. something like that. Uh, <laughs> so I think it's true. I mean, uh, you know, people in kind of tough situations, if approached right, is very funny. I mean, I think. You know, th this thing would happen to me for a while where my friends would tell me their dramatic movie ideas, and I'd always be like, oh, that sounds hilarious. And they'd be like, it's not a comedy. I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> it could be. Uh, and I think and I think any movie could be a comedy, honestly. Uh, I haven't seen The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, but it seems like there's some funny shit in there. Uh, so uh, I, think, um, <laughs> I, th I think almost any movie could be approached comedically. Almost any subject matter could be approached comedically comedically and and yeah I think generally the more uh, you know trying the situation the the funnier the movie could be and the more potential for for comedy there because the stakes are really high and I think high stakes uh, lead to you know more more drama which leads to more comedy uh, well one thing I wanted to ask you I mean as you I'm sure have been you know promoting this movie and, and talking to people you probably I'm sure encounter a lot of people who have also had uh, you know, similar experiences, and they want to share that with you. I mean, does does that give you a feeling of of you know? Do you do you feel a sense of sort of obligation to those people once even once an experience like this is over? Do you want to keep making you know movies or or TV projects in in this kind of a mode? Um, well, I mean, it's true. I mean, I, I, you know, I, both Seth and I have have done numerous events with different cancer organizations and charities, and met with survivors and current patients and I mean you know it's, it's incredible I mean they all tell us you know the same thing that they feel like this is one this is the first time that they they can watch a movie and they can relate to it and they can connect to it and that they feel like they have a voice and suddenly they're having conversations that they didn't know how to have before seeing the movie which was not our intention and I think it's incredibly it's incredibly gratifying to know that um, but when we, you know, when we set out to, to make the movie, that was, that, you know, we weren't thinking about how is it going to connect with people who are in similar situations. We were thinking more about how is, you know, how is this the best movie, and how does this feel honest, and how does this feel real? Yeah. So I, there was never a part where we were like, oh, we shouldn't do that. Other people who are sick won't relate to that. It yeah. was always very personal to what he went through. And and so you know, in like the next script that I'm I'm writing. You know, there's a there's a uh, there's a grandmother character who has Alzheimer's, and I am not thinking about writing it from the perspective of other people who have are are going through similar situations. I'm thinking about it more in the sense of how does it feel honest to the characters in this in this world, and how you know, and 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 I think that that's that's what's most important. And you know, you hope that people can then connect to it, you know, beyond there. But I think it it has to just. It has to start from a place that feels very real and honest. And if, I think if you worry too much about how other people are going to 
perceive it and how they're going to welcome it, I think you just sort of get caught in this game of constantly trying to please other people's expectations. And, and I, so I, I try not to do that. Right, right. Seth, was there anything that, you know, I mean, just larger, you know, filmmaking lessons that you took away from, from this experience? Would you like to do uh, more producing of this, of this kind? Uh, yeah, uh, me and Evan are definitely starting to produce more, and it is, um, it is fun to be able to give a bunch of notes on a script and then not have to execute them, and uh, <laughs> it's really nice to just point out what's wrong and then go right. hang out, and then a few weeks later they bring it back and it's better. It's great. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, if, I, I, I mean, I guess I learned that, like, you can make a movie about anything, and that, and, and that, and that, and also learn that if the more personal it is to you, probably the better movie it's going to make. Um, if if you write about something that you really feel strongly about and that you really connect with, then it'll probably be a better movie than some guy who's just writing about some shit because he thinks it's it's funny, you know. So that that. And you know, and I think, and it's amazing that he did it. Honestly, I mean, anytime someone goes through something tough and then actually like turns it to anything remotely positive is like really amazing. Some people are just miserable, and so it's it's incredible that Will actually got off his ass and did it. You know, I mean, I'm sure there's tons of people who talk about doing that their whole lives and never do it. So I think it's amazing more than anything that he actually did it. I mean, I think that for me. You know, the writing it was 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 difficult because that was you know I sort of had to unearth a lot of difficult moments from my life and you know that was my way of processing it and and I I I did really feel like through through that I I I moved on from that you know part of my life and it's been interesting to to now go and you know as we were you know we were out promoting the movie you know we've had to talk a lot about it, but I've had to talk a lot about my experience and in in a way. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a part of me that would really like to move on, um, but I I think, you know, I, I I this you know this is a story that you know will I'll always have this incredibly personal connection to you know to that story to fifty fifty and and Adam you know the character of Adam really, um, you know really there's a piece of me in that character and so um, I think. Uh, in, in some ways, you know, I wish that I could I could just completely move on from it. But in some ways, it's I think it's it's really special that you know there there that I was able to to take my experience and and create something that other people can relate to. And and so um, while I I'll always you know I'll be I'll always be thinking about what my next project is. I think you know this this will always be really special for me. Yes, we did write super bad. We started writing it when we were 13 or 14, when we were in high school. And uh, and a lot of the shit that we wrote in high school actually stayed in there because it, some of it happened. The McLovin joke that we wrote that when we were 14, I wish I could say I was, I've gotten funnier since then, but I haven't probably. <laughs> um, the, the period blood thing happened while we were in high school, so that we put that in the script right when it happened. So... The blood wasn't even dry before that was in there. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, we, uh, uh, yeah, a, a lot of the stuff remained from the original version of the script, but the whole emotional story didn't come uh, till around 10 years later, I would say. Um, and yeah. then, I, I, I don't know, I'm trying to think of what my favorite segment is. I mean, I think that what was my favorite, my favorite parts of the show to work on were with Borat. And that was because when working with Ali G and the character Ali G and, we're, and doing, se you know, doing segments that were Ali G and doing segments that were Bruno, people would get really angry afterwards. Then you'd have to deal with them. But with Borat, like, I remember there was, was this one time where... They liked we, him a lot, They right? loved yeah. him, especially when you went to the South. And he would, there was this one segment we did where he, you know, it's like Borat's trying to uh, integrate himself in, into American culture, and so he's, he's shopping for a house. And I remember, like, he... He like he goes in the bathroom and he comes out with you know and he poos in a, in a Ziploc bag and he carries it out and then like and he went he went swimming in in this pool naked and the people and he went and he like learned etiquette and he went you know uh, on job interviews with this head humping uh, this um, this head hunter uh, that's what it's called head hunter yeah. right yeah um, and uh, and they and everyone would just be like. Will, we just want you to know that Borat is just the most wonderful human being. <laughs> Such a delight. And like, and I like, I just always, people always fell in love with him. But with Bruno, people would just 
yell and curse and scream at me. <laughs> because those people were usually homophobic or racist, and like they were really difficult to deal with. So, so the the the, the pl I got pleasure out of making uh, the brun the the Bora I mean, yeah, the Borat segment. Right. And, and I mean, this this is a, I mean, this is sort of known, but I mean, people were never let in on on what was no. occurring. It's no, not until after no one had any idea right. until the show aired. We never. Sure, a lot of those anybody. people still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> are you still under any sort of legal? Uh, I mean, are there there are probably certain details. He said we can just talk about, about it. I, I mean, I, yeah. I always tell him, like, I don't know what the f to say. People always ask me about it. I don't want to, like, blow any secrets. And he was like, just say whatever you want. Yeah. I, I still don't say it, though. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I still feel uncomfortable because when we were, when we were making it, I was, un, you know, there were, we there were strict guidelines. for. I was not allowed to talk about it. I, I mean, I, like, I wasn't really allowed to tell people I worked for the show. Uh, when I would, when, you know, I was working on segments, I had to be very, uh, there were specific guidelines that the lawyer had construct, like had, uh, had told me that, instructed me that I could and things I could and could not say. And so, I mean, I just would not sleep at night because I was so paranoid. It sounds that like we'd neurotic get... personalities on this show could really, you could really run with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've had entire. I mean, we have entire scripts that we think are awesome that have not been made in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're really trying to make an R-rated, uh, animated CGI, like Pixar-style movie um, called Sausage Party, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it might happen one day. But until then, that's like our that's our white whale. That's kind of what we're. <laughs> It's about, it's about a group of sausages who want to... <laughs> Don't give it away. All right. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a movie, and they'll see it. <laughs> Very funny. Uh, but it's funny. And, and that, I mean, honestly, all of our, uh, our movies generally take years to get going. We've never come up with a movie where people are like, yes. It's always like, eh, and then slowly it, we, like, wear people down. So um, <laughs> I think every movie is kind of, you know, we're always kind of trying to make our dream movie. Uh, and, and it takes a long time to get them made, generally speaking. <laughs> One more round of applause, please, for Seth Rogen. Oh, okay. Thank you.